This is a factory where clocks are made. And there are lots of different shapes and colours, aren't there? There are square ones, round ones, some unusual ones. But they all have a front part called the clock face. And most have three hands that show us the time. But do you know what each hand is for? This short hand here points to the hours, so it's called the hour hand. And this long hand here points to the minutes. It's the minute hand. And then this long, thin hand counts the seconds. It's called the seconds hand. And as the clock ticks, the seconds hand moves. One, two, three, four. Can you hear it ticking? As time passes, the hands move around the clock face, pointing to the numbers so we can tell what time it is. It's easy to see the red seconds hand moving, but to see the hours and minutes, we have to look for a long time. So I've bought a special camera to help. It can film a time lapse, which means it records for a long time, but when we watch it back, we see the action happening really quickly. Right, the camera is in place. Let me check what time it is now. The short hand is pointing to number two, and the long hand is pointing to number 12. So the time is... That's right, it's two o'clock. And we're going to leave my camera filming for one whole hour. So what do you think's going to happen? Let's find out. Wait. Here we are, one hour later, and now it's three o'clock. So I've stopped recording and let's play this back and find out what happened to the hands. Remember, we're seeing the clock hands move much faster now. The red seconds hand moves the fastest. The long black minute hand moves more slowly. And the short black hour hand moves slowest of all, from two to three. It's great to see the hands moving fast like that, isn't it? But how do the hands move around the clock face at the right speed? Well, the answer is here, inside this little box. It's called the mechanism. But to find out how the mechanism works, I think we need to take a closer look. All clocks need power to work. Most clocks are powered by batteries. The battery sends a small electric current through a circuit board. The circuit board makes a tiny crystal called a quartz vibrate. A microchip, which is like a tiny computer, counts the vibrations and turns them into electric pulses of exactly one pulse every second. The pulse then powers a tiny motor, which makes wheels called gears turn around and around. There is one gear for the seconds hand, a gear for the minute hand, and a gear for the hour hand. The gears are attached to a shaft that goes through the middle of the clock face and spins the hands around the clock at exactly the right speed. So we can look at the hands and see what time it is. Now, should we have a look inside the mechanism of a real clock? Wow. The parts inside this mechanism are really, really small. I've got my special camera with me so we can take a closer look. The lens on my special camera works like a magnifying glass, so you can see the tiny parts inside. The microchip is this part here, and then the motor is this bit, the part with a copper wire wrapped around it, and it's the motor that makes the gears go round. Can you see the gears? They have little grooves around the edge. Well, those grooves are called teeth, and those teeth 
lock together like this, so that when one gear goes round, the other one will turn at the same time. And there is a gear for each of the hands. One, two, three. Now we know how it works, let's go and see a mechanism being fitted to a face to make a finished clock. And there we have it, a lovely blue clock. Let's put a battery inside it and see what happens. Wow, it's working. You can see the second hand moving around. Tick, tock, tick, tock. So now we can tell what time it is. I loved seeing how clocks work. What was your favourite part? the name of the round wheels that turned the clock hands. That's right, they're called gears. Did you hear the sound the second hand made as it went around the clock face? And did you see how the hands moved at different... To make a mattress, we've come to a mattress factory. It's absolutely huge. They can make a thousand mattresses here every single day. Making a mattress is a bit like making a big sandwich. Now, the outside of the mattress is called the outer casing, and it's made of thin layers of fabric and a material called wadding. And it's the outside that holds everything together. And inside, you have the filling. Here we have a layer of something called foam, and foam is soft and spongy. It makes the mattress really comfortable to sleep on. And then we have a layer of a material called polyester, and that protects these bits, the soft, springy parts. What do you think's inside here? That's right, it's a spring. A spring is a piece of metal that's been coiled around and fixed into this shape. And it's really strong, so that when you push down on it, it will always spring back to the same shape. And it's what makes a mattress so springy to lie on. But how do you think all of these parts come together? The springs arrive at the factory in big rolls like this. But to use them in mattresses, we need to make them flat. So the rolls are put into this machine, which unravels them into flat beds of springs. Oh, here comes the first one now. It looks a bit like a giant honeycomb. Next, it's the foam layer. This is where the factory keeps all of the foam. But these blocks of foam are far too big for our mattress. So the big blocks of foam get chopped into slices by this foam cutting machine. It's a bit like slicing through a big cake. But what makes foam so squashy? I'm going to use my special camera so we can see the foam in more detail. This is a microscopic camera, which means we can see really small things much bigger. Take a look at this. Whoa! Look at that. Can you see? There are hundreds and hundreds of tiny pockets of air inside the foam. It's a little bit like a sponge you might use in the bath. But watch this. When I squash the foam, the air is pushed out of those pockets. And when I let go, the air rushes back in. And it's the air that makes the foam squashy. It's brilliant, isn't it? Next, the mattress's outer casing is made in a machine which puts thin fabric together with squishy wadding. Wow, this enormous machine is a quilting machine. And its job is to roll and stitch the different layers of material together to make one soft batter layer. Can you see all of the thread going over the top of my head? It's like being under a giant spider's web. See the pattern it's making to stitch the layers together. They look like diamonds, don't they? Now it's time to make the sides of the outer casing, called the border. Look how these 
these two robot sewing machines are working together to stitch a circle pattern. This one does the first half, and this one does the other. Clever, isn't it? And soon, there's a finished roll of border. So, we have the top layer and the borders of the outer casing. Now we just need the bottom, and that's cut here. The guys, they cut ten at a time. Look how fast that fabric cutter moves. It's like a little remote control car. <laughs> but it can only move in straight lines, so the round corners are trimmed with a hand cutter. And here we have all of the parts we need to make a mattress. Now it's just time to put it together, like a sandwich. The different layers are fixed together with tiny silver rings. The bottom layer first. Then the polyester. The foam filling and that quilted outer casing. Finally, the border is fixed around the edges. But it's not quite finished yet. This is a tape edging machine, and it's Mark's job to move it all the way around the edges. It's like it's chomping around the edges. Can you hear it? And here we have a finished mattress. All it needs is a plastic coat to keep it clean while it's transported. Then it's popped onto this moving track called a conveyor belt. But where do you think they go? Let's use my special camera to find out. Here we go. They're going on quite a journey, aren't they? They come here, to the warehouse, where they're stored, ready to be sent out across the country. I've come to a warehouse, and here they test lots of different machines that we use around the home, like washing machines, cookers, and vacuum cleaners. There are lots of different vacuum cleaners here, in different shapes and sizes and colours. But how does a vacuum cleaner work? This is the button that you use to switch it on and off. And this part here is the hose that sucks up bits. It's like a snake, isn't it? And then this part just here is the pedal, which you use to roll it along. But there are lots of parts of this vacuum cleaner that you can't see. But here at the warehouse, we've got special permission to take a vacuum cleaner apart so we can look at some of the important parts inside. There are a lot of different parts to a vacuum cleaner, aren't there? Let's look at some of the most important ones. So, this here is the motor, and it moves this part inside. It's called the fan. You see the fan moving? And it's the motor that makes a lot of noise. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> this is the agitator brush and it sits right at the bottom of the vacuum cleaner and its job is to brush along the carpet really quickly. Ooh. This here is the container and it just catches all of the dirt. And this part which sits on top of it is the filter and this bit traps the dust. But to find out how a vacuum cleaner sucks up all of the bits of dirt and dust really quickly, I think we need to take a closer look inside. When the vacuum cleaner is switched on, the motor inside moves a fan which spins really, really fast. It's so fast that it causes the fan to suck air from the outside up through a suction pipe. Just like sucking a straw. The rotating agitator brush on the bottom of the vacuum cleaner loosens the dirt and dust on the carpet. The air, dust and dirt are then sucked up the pipe into the vacuum. The air spins around really fast and the dirt falls to the bottom of the container and is caught in a filter. The air is pushed through the filter and the clean air is blown back outside through the exhaust. 
When the carpet is vacuumed, the container full of bits and dirt is emptied, ready for next time. That was brilliant, wasn't it? Now, I'm going to use my special camera so we can see how it works close up. But remember, this is a special camera, so you mustn't do this yourself. I'm going to put the special camera inside the container so we can see exactly what it sucks up. Looks good. I'm sprinkling some tea leaves onto the carpet. That's what they use here to test if a vacuum cleaner is working properly. Look how small they are. Because the tea leaves are so tiny, I've also got some little pieces of coloured paper, so we should be able to see these spinning around the container when they've been sucked up by the vacuum. There we go. Let's switch it on. Look at that! The bits of paper and the tea leaves are being sucked up into the container. Wow! and it's coming out here through the exhaust. Now we can see it better if I hold this little piece of ribbon up to the exhaust. It's just like a flag on a windy day. So we have a lovely clean carpet, but where do you think all those tea leaves and pieces of paper have gone? That's right, they're inside the container. Let's take a look at my special camera. There they are. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Got a bit dusty, didn't it? Most televisions we enjoy watching programmes and films on have the same main parts. This is a remote control. It has lots of buttons on it and we use it to turn the television off and on. We can also use the remote control to turn the sound level, called the volume, up or down, making it louder. Well, that's really loud now, isn't it? Or quieter. Now it sounds really quiet. But the biggest part of a television is this rectangle here. Do you know what it's called? It's called the screen. And when the television is turned off, the screen goes black. And when the television is turned on, the picture appears so we can watch a programme. But how do the colours and pictures appear on the screen? I think we need to take a closer look. The screens on mobile phones, tablets and televisions are made up of thousands of tiny squares called pixels. Under a magnifying glass, one tiny pixel is a square block filled with colour. But if we zoom into the pixel closer than we can see with our eyes or a magnifying glass, each pixel is made from three different coloured lights called subpixels. The lights are red, green and blue. When all three lights are turned right down, the pixel will be black. When all three lights are at full brightness, the pixel will be white. When the three lights are turned up or down to different levels across the whole screen, we see millions of different colours. And all the tiny pixels together, filled with different colours, make the pictures we see on our screens. You should never sit too close or try to see the television pixels yourself, so I've got my special microscopic camera to look closely for us. The microscopic camera can see really tiny things and make them look much bigger. Let's use it to see if we can see the lights that make up a pixel on a television screen. But first, I'm going to pause the picture so that it stops moving. Now, let's put my microscopic camera on this white area just here and have a look at what we can see. Wow, look at that. We can see lots and lots of sets of coloured stripes. They are red, green and blue. These are the subpixels. 
and each set of those stripes makes up one pixel on the TV screen. Now, because these lights here are turned up to full brightness, our eyes see those pixels as the colour white. So now if I move the microscope to this black area of colour here, now the microscope can't see anything at all. That's because the lights in these pixels, the red, green and blue lights, have been turned right down. So the microscope can't see the pixels, but our eyes see that colour as black. If I try putting the microscope camera on this purpley colour there, look! Now we can see a lot of blue light and a little bit of red light. That's because blue and red make purple. And if I try to put the microscope on this orange area here, the microscope can see lots of red and a little bit of green light, and our eyes see that as orange. Now I want to try something. I'm going to press play so the pictures start moving again. And if the pictures are moving, the colours will change, so the light in the pixels should change too. Let's give it a go. Ah, there they went. Now we've got green lights, blue lights. <gasps> Green and blue, multicoloured. <laughs> the lights in the pixels are changing as the pictures move so that we can see millions of different shades of colour. When we watch a television screen, the pixels are much further away and we see those pixels as different colours. And those colours make up the pictures on the television screen. Carpet factory. It's very big, very noisy, and full of enormous machines that make carpets. Here they make over 300,000 square meters of carpet every year that go onto big rolls like that. That's enough carpet to cover 42 football pitches. Carpets could be made from lots of different materials, but all the carpets in this factory are made from wool. Wool comes from sheep. Their woolly coats, called fleeces, are removed in the summer to keep them cool. Lots of things are made from wool, like my woolly hat, jumpers and even socks. It is made of lots of short threads called tufts and I've got some tufts just here. If we take a look, can you see them in the carpet? The tufts are fixed into place by weaving them into rougher threads on the back of the carpet. There are two types of these threads. Wefts that go across and warps that go up and down. But it's quite tricky to see, so I'm going to use my special camera so that we can take a closer look. This is a microscope and it lets me see small things much, much bigger. Look! Now we can really see the wefts and the warps. The wefts are the bits that are going across the carpet and they look a little bit like straw, don't they? And then can you see the thinner white threads that are going over and under, over and under the wefts? Those are called the warps. And those wefts and warps work together to trap the tufts and that makes our carpet. Clever, isn't it? Before it arrives at the factory, the wool has been spun into something called yarn. But to be turned into carpet, it has to be wound onto reels like this. This is called a bobbin. And to make a big patterned carpet, we need thousands of them. Wow, now this is a lot of brightly coloured bobbins. This machine is called a creel, and there are around 13,000 bobbins loaded onto it. The yarn is pulled off all of these bobbins and is gently guided from holes up here all the way down to some holes down there, and that stops all of the yarn getting tangled. But it just looks like a beautiful rainbow spider's web, doesn't it? All of the coloured threads of yarn then feed into a huge machine called a loom. A loom is a machine that turns yarn into carpet through a process called weaving. 
the loom weaves the yarn into the weft and warp threads that we saw earlier. It looks incredible, but it all happens so fast. Let's look in more detail. This is my special slow motion camera and it lets me see things that are happening really quickly, much slower. Let's go. First, the coloured yarn is cut into tufts. Look, a shiny metal claw called the gripper holds the yarn in place, then a knife slides across to cut it. The gripper pulls the tufts down to where the weft and warp threads are. A fast metal stick called a rapier pulls the weft thread across, while metal teeth weave the warp threads under and over. This traps the tufts in place, a bit like a sandwich. This loom makes eight square metres of carpet every hour. That's the same size as four single beds. After it comes off the loom, any little holes that are left are stitched by hand. To make extra sure that the tufts don't fall out, a coating is put on the back of the carpet. And the coating is made of a material called latex. It's a white sticky material that looks a little bit like glue. It's heated as it travels on rollers until it dries and hardens. I can feel the heat though. It's really warm in here. The carpet is rolled onto this raised floor where it gets a final check. All the carpets are then wrapped in plastic and taken to the storeroom. And here we have some finished carpet, wrapped up and ready to be rolled out across floors all over the country. There are lots of different types of baths. Baths? with straight edges, baths with curved edges, and some even have doors. But how are baths made? Baths are made here, in a bath factory. Baths can be made from different materials, but the one we're making today is made from a type of strong plastic called acrylic. Here we are. This is a flat sheet of acrylic and it's just enough to make one bath. Look, it's long enough for one person. But how do we make this flat sheet of acrylic curved like a bath? The acrylic goes into the oven, which is set at 180 degrees. That's about the same temperature that you might bake a cake in your oven at home. The heat from the oven makes the acrylic soft and bendy so it can be moulded into a new shape. And after 20 minutes, the acrylic is ready to come out. Whoa, look at that! The acrylic's gone all floppy! It's all wibbly-wobbly, isn't it? The wobbly acrylic is put onto a machine called the bath tool and is clamped into place ready to be shaped. Air from tiny holes in the bath tool is blowing the wobbly acrylic up like a balloon to make the material stretchy and now the air is sucking that wobbly acrylic into the bath tool. Wow! Look! Now it looks like the shape of a bath. The acrylic is then left to cool for about five minutes until it becomes a hard shell. Now it looks more like a bath, doesn't it? It's very light, but also it's too thin. We need it to be much stronger than this. To see the next stage, we need to wear a protective suit because the acrylic shell is going to be sprayed with a material called fiberglass. Fiberglass isn't like the glass you'd find in your windows at home. It's actually a type of plastic but it has tiny strands of glass inside. The fibreglass starts curled up in these big reels called bobbins, and then it comes all the way over here 
to this. It's called a chop roving gun, and this is Vinny. It's his job to use it. The chop roving gun has a small spinning wheel with some blades on it that turn round and round, and that chops the fibreglass into short little pieces. Can you see? And I'm putting a special camera on top of the chop roving gun so we can see how it works close up. Take it away, Vinny. Wow, look how fast it sprays. The chop roving gun is blasting those little pieces of fibreglass onto the bar, along with a sticky liquid called resin. Can you see the mixture sticking to the bar? When that dries, it will make a strong, hard shell. But at the moment, the bath looks furry. Next, a wooden baseboard is added to the bottom of the bath to give it even more strength. Then the bath is loaded onto a carrier and put through a heated tunnel to dry. It's completely dry and now the shell feels much stronger and harder. The bath is lifted up by this long suction hose and it's taken over to another machine called a CNC machine. Inside the CNC machine, any rough edges are trimmed by a spinning blade. And then a filing tool is used to make them nice and smooth. Now, it really does look like a bath, doesn't it? But there is something missing. Do you know what it is? This bath needs two holes. One here for the plug hole, that's where the water drains away, and one here called the overflow. So if there's too much water in the bath, it can drain out. Can you hear the sound of the drill making the plug hole? Made it through. The bath is then packed in cardboard and plastic covers to protect it. We have a finished bath, all wrapped up, ready to be sent to the shops. Toilet rolls are made here, in a ginormous toilet roll factory. Look at the size of these toilet rolls. I feel like I've shrunk. These huge rolls will be cut down to the size of toilet roll we use at home. And here, they make two million of those every day. That's enough to fill 12 train carriages. Toilet roll, like this one, starts out at the factory like this. Huge packets of something called pulp. Pulp is a material that's made from wood that comes from trees. Pulp is used to make all sorts of paper, like newspaper birthday cards and paper towels and after it's been used it can be recycled back into pulp and used again so the next time you put some paper in the recycling bin it could end up as toilet roll to turn pulp into paper you need water lots and lots of it the packets of pulp are dropped with a loud splosh into this huge machine called the pulper. This is like a giant mixing bowl and inside there are some spinning blades that help to mix the dry pulp with all of this hot water. I've got my special camera with me on a really long pole so we can see everything that's happening inside the pulper a little bit closer. Here goes. is mixed into the water really quickly. I've been splashed! <laughs> Look at my goggles! The dry pulp and the water have mixed together and it looks a little bit like cottage cheese. I've got a bucket of wet pulp here. Oh! <laughs> that feels really squidgy and squelchy. The wet pulp is turned into paper in a massive machine called a paper mill. It's very big and very noisy. First, the watery pulp is sprayed 
onto a huge piece of fabric and that fabric carries the mixture through the paper mill. Lots of rollers squeeze the water from the wet paper and then it travels to this big spinning drum. And in there, the air is really hot. That heat heats up the paper until it's nice and dry. The dried paper is then wound around metal pipes, creating these enormous rolls. It looks like toilet paper for giants. The rolls are moved across to a machine called a converter. The converter's job is to turn these big rolls into smaller ones that we can use at home. And this part of the machine is called the unwinder. It's unwinding the toilet paper off the big metal pipe. But to make small toilet rolls, we need something to wind the paper onto. That's right, what are these? It's a cardboard tube. And the toilet roll tubes start out like this. It's a big reel of cardboard. A very thin layer of glue is rolled onto the cardboard strips here, and then it's wound onto a metal tube. And this is where it's stuck in place into the shape of a cardboard tube. The tubes are chopped into long pieces and then loaded onto the converter, where the long sheets of toilet paper are wound around them. As the paper is wound onto the cardboard tube, little holes called perforations are punched into the paper. Can you see the little holes there? They make it much easier to tear off squares of toilet paper when we use it at home. Oh, here one comes. And this is what the roll looks like now. But this is far too long. It's not going to fit in anyone's bathroom, is it? So the long rolls are brought here. This machine is the log saw, and inside there's a blade that will cut the toilet roll to the right side. The blade spins round very fast, cutting four toilet rolls at the same time. But just look at how many toilet rolls there are. All of this is on its way to packing. And here we have a finished pack of toilet roll, ready to be sent to the shops for us to buy and use. Take a look at this fridge here. It's just like the one we have in our kitchen, but this one's had a few pieces taken away so we can get a better look at how it works. Can you see all the way around the fridge door there's this piece of rubber. It's called the seal. And inside the seal there's a magnet and the magnet helps to keep the fridge door shut. And the seal keeps the cold air inside the fridge sealed in and the warm air outside the fridge sealed out. But I really like the noise it makes. Listen to this. It's like a suction noise, isn't it? You mustn't try to get to the back of your fridge at home, so I'm going to show you what it looks like and how it works. A fridge needs power to work, so it's plugged into an electric socket, and the electricity is needed to power this machine here. It's called a compressor. The compressor is a type of pump which moves gas around the fridge to keep it cool. So this is where a gas enters the compressor and that is where it leaves it. The pipe that comes out of the compressor snakes back and forward all the way to the top of the fridge and all the way back down again. That's a lot of pipes, but eventually the pipe goes inside the fridge. This fridge has had its plastic lining removed inside so we can see where the pipe goes next. It snakes around the top part of the fridge and then back down again to the compressor. In total, the pipe is 35 metres long. That's nearly as long as eight family cars. But how does that pipe work to keep the fridge nice and cold? To find out, I think we need to take a closer look. At the back of the fridge, inside the pipe, is a special liquid called refrigerant. This travels through a part called the expansion valve, where it's pushed through really quickly, turning it from a liquid into a vapour. As the vapour flows through the pipe inside the fridge, 
it absorbs and removes heat from the food inside. And this turns the vapour into a gas. It's called evaporation. It keeps the fridge and the food inside cold too. Then the gas travels to the compressor. The compressor pushes the hot gas out through a pipe, which squeezes the gas molecules together. And as the molecules move closer together, the gas cools and turns back into a liquid. This is called condensing. The liquid refrigerant moves through the pipe at the back of the fridge, ready to start the whole process again. Wasn't that interesting? I'm going to show you how cold it gets inside the fridge using my special camera. This is a thermal imaging camera and it shows me how hot or cold things are by showing different colours. So these grapes, let's see what colour they are on the camera. Oh look! The grapes look yellow and a little bit orange. That's because they're quite warm out here on the kitchen table. The milk has been in the fridge, so what colour do you think it's going to be? <gasps> Look at that! The grapes are yellow, but the milk is dark blue. And that's because it is much, much colder. So what do you think will happen if I put the grapes in the fridge? What colour will they be then? Whoa, inside the fridge it looks dark, solid blue. What colour do you think the grapes will turn if I leave them in the fridge for a few minutes? Shall we find out? Now, you mustn't do this with your camera at home, but I've got special permission to put the thermal camera inside the fridge so I can show you the grapes cooling down. To make the grapes colder, the compressor is pumping the special refrigerant liquid around those condenser pipes at the back of the fridge. Inside the pipes in the fridge, the refrigerant is turning into a gas as it absorbs the heat and takes away the warmth from the grapes. And then that gas goes back down to the compressor where it's turned back into a liquid again. And it keeps going round and round and round. Right, the grapes have been in there for a few minutes. Should we see what they look like on the thermal camera? The grapes have been inside the fridge for a few minutes, so they've cooled down and now they look blue. How clever is that? <laughs> <laughs>